Thus far working with springs, we have only let the internal system create force and motion. But sometimes we have what's called a driving force, which is an external force on the system that we have to account for. How do we model motion with an external force? And this is what we're talking about when we say we have driven motion. We're going to have some function f of t that is a function of the driving force over time. We'll have the position of the spring or I should say the position of the spring mass m with dash pot resistance beta and spring constant K is given by the differential equation, the mass times x prime prime plus beta times x prime plus the constant times x equals, and to account for the external force, it equals some function over time of that external force. Let's take a look at an example. Let's say I have a mass of 0.2 slugs, a damping force of 1.2, a spring constant of 2, with a driving force of 5 cosine of 4t. And this type of a driving force is really common when we're dealing with circular gears and motion. Given, let's say the initial position is 1 half of a foot and the initial velocity is 0. Well, plugging into our differential equation, we have that our mass is 0.2 times x prime prime plus the damping force of 1.2 x prime plus the spring constant of 2x is equal to 5 cosine of 4t. It's the driving force. This then becomes what we solved in our non-homogeneous higher ordered linear differential equations with constant coefficients. We already know how to solve these. And yes, the process is several steps, but we're very familiar with it. To make the math easier, I'm just going to multiply both sides by 5, gets rid of the decimals to get x prime prime plus 6x prime plus 10x equals 25 cosine of 4t. We'll set up the auxiliary equation, r squared plus 6r plus 10, which is equal to the homogeneous version, equal to 0. I'm going to complete the square on this because that middle term is even. So I'm going to subtract 10 from both sides and then add half of 6 is 3, 3 squared is 9. I'm going to add 9 to both sides. So this becomes r plus 3 squared equals negative 1 or r plus 3 is plus or minus i, or r is equal to negative 3 plus or minus i. Which means now we have the complementary solution. x complement is e to the negative 3t times c1 cosine of 1t plus c2 
sine of 1t. All right. Now that we have the complementary solution, we need to do some work to find the particular solution so that we can add the complementary plus the particular to get the general solution for where the mass is at any given point in time. Well, we know from variation of parameters that the form of the particular solution is going to be, since we have a cosine, a cosine of 4t plus b sine of 4t. And I do want to check really quick to make sure that's linearly independent from x complement. Cosine of 4t and cosine of t are linearly independent. The system actually runs into a lot of trouble if they are not linearly independent. And you can watch the Galloping Gertie video in Blackboard to see uh, what happens when x particular is not linearly independent from x complement. But I'll save that for that video. We then need to find x particular prime which is negative 4a sine of 4t plus 4b cosine of 4t and x particular prime prime which is negative 16a cosine of 4t minus 16b sine of 4t. I'm going to use the green line because I don't want to deal with the decimals. So we've got 1x prime prime, 6x primes, and 10x's. So I'm going to multiply both sides by those coefficients. And when I do, I'm going to organize my results under the cosine of 4t and the sine of 4t. So we've got 10a cosines, 10b sines, negative 24a on the sine, 24b on the cosine, negative 16a on the cosine, and negative 16b on the sine. So when I add those up, I get negative 6a plus 24b equals, this is the cosine column, we want 25 cosines. Adding up the other one, we get negative 24a minus 6b equals 0, because we have 0 sines. Getting a little more space to work. I'm going to solve these. Let's multiply the first equation by negative 4. And when we do, we'll get positive 24a minus 96b, doing that on the calculator, equals a negative 100. So negative 102b equals negative 100. So b is equal to a positive 50 over 51. OK. Plugging that into the other equation, we've got negative 6a plus 24 times b, which is 50 over 51 equals 25. Negative 6a plus 24 times 50 is 1,200 over 51, and let's make 25 have a common denominator. 25 times 51 is 1275 over 51. So negative 6a is equal to 75 over 51, which means dividing by 6, and let's see, the 6 and 75 are both divisible by 3, gives me negative 25 over 2 times 51, which is 102. So we've got A and B, so now we can say we know what X particular is equal to. Using that X particular line, X particular is A, negative 25 over 102. Cosine of 4t 
plus b, which is 50 over 51, sine of 4t. And if we put this all together, we're going to end up with our solution for x. x complement plus x particular. e to the negative 3t times c1 cosine of t plus c2 sine of t plus x particular, which is negative 25 over 102 cosine of 4t plus 50 over 51 sine of 4t. But we still have to go back and find our initial conditions to find C1 and C2. We were told that the initial position x of 0 at time of 0 is 1 half. And we're also told on x prime the initial velocity at 0 was 0. So let's also calculate x prime. We've got a product rule, so it's negative 3 e to the negative 3 t times c1 cosine of t plus c2 sine of t plus e to the negative 3 t times the derivative of the inside, which is negative c1 sine of t plus c2 cosine of t. Now on the last part, uh, multiplying by negative 4 gives us a positive uh, 4 over 102 will reduce to 2 over 51. 2 times 25 is 50 over 51 sine of 4t plus 50 times 4 is 200 over 51 cosine of 4t. All right, plugging those values in, in the first equation, we end up with 1 half equals e to the 0 is 1 times c1. Cosine is 1, sine is 0, minus 25 over 102 times 1 plus 0. So if we add 25 over 102, we've got 51 over 102 with the common denominator. 51 plus 25, let's just go down. So if I make this 51 over 102 plus 25 over 102 is 76 over 102 which is going to reduce to 38 over 51 equals my first constant. All right, from the second equation, plugging in 0, 0, we get 0 equals negative 3 times 1, C1. Sine goes to 0 plus C2 e to the negative 3 is 1, the sine goes to 0, the cosine goes to 1, plus the sine goes to 0, so we have 200 over 51. But we know what C1 is. It's 38 over 51 plus C2 plus 200 over 51. Um, 3 times 38 is negative 114 over 51. We've also got plus 200 over 51 plus a C2. Negative 114 plus 200 is 86. So if we subtract that, we get negative 86 over 51 equals C2. All right, the fractions aren't pretty, and the arithmetic to get there might not have been so pleasant, but we were able to still work through this very familiar process 
to solve now for our equation x, which if I use my x equals equation up above, we see that's equal to e to the negative 3t times c1, which is 38 over 51, cosine of t, plus c2, which is negative 86 over 51, sine of t, plus the driving force, which is negative 25 over 102 cosine of 4t, plus 50 over 51 sine of 4t. And what I want to look at with this equation is if you notice that as time goes to infinity, the initial conditions ends up becoming e to the negative infinity, which is approaching 0. So the initial position is going to go to 0, which means over time, as time goes to infinity, we're going to actually approach the particular solution. We call this particular part the steady state. In other words, it's the impact of that driving force. Because those initial conditions are going to ultimately go to zero as the steady state and the damping force pull it down and under control. The steady state, though, that driving force never stops. And so it's going to continue on as time goes to infinity. And we can see that if we look at the graph. What we see here is our function has been graphed in this red line. It starts at 1 half like we expected. And since there's no initial velocity, it's going to take off from that driving force. And then it's going to be pulled down. And the driving force is going to eventually take over. And it's going to start to look harmonic on the driving force. I've actually got a separate function set up that describes the driving force. And when I turn that on, you can see this purple line is slightly off because of those initial uh, force that's on the spring from that initial release with at one half at time zero. But eventually that driving force will take over and those graphs will start to merge and become closer and closer to each other. So that's how we can model that driven motion. Setting up the equation is really the only new thing we're seeing. We've solved these type of equations for quite a while now, and we should be very comfortable with it. So now it's your turn to practice solving these equations.